And so one of the more obvious questions that arises with hypertime is how does this relate to special relativity and the time dilation and length contraction and the um, relativistic velocity issues that come into play with special relativity and the, uh, the math that's involved there. Um, and hypertime actually sheds a lot of light on this. Hypertime actually extends, qualifies, clarifies what this phenomenon is really all about. And it's all based on the notion of movement. It's all based on our notion, our perception of physical movement. And we assume that it's possible to move from one place to another. And anyone that's familiar with Zeno's paradox knows that if that movement is continuous, that there are an infinite number of smaller movements in between the two points that are necessary for the movement of an object. And so how can an object move an infinite number of times in a finite amount of time? And so this is a problem for movement in general. How does something move? And I think what blinded us with quantum mechanics and particle physics is the nature of the quanta, the nature that the, the fact that an object on a small scale uh, doesn't move continuously. This is the exception. This is how it happens. The object moves from one wavelength of itself to another through time. And in some, but uh, what I'm proposing is by the mechanism of hypertime. And the hypertime wavelength is the key to understanding uh, time dilation. Because as that wavelength changes, as the distance, you know, as something accelerates towards a relativistic velocity, it starts skipping uh, beats, if you will. It starts, it starts materializing at rate, rates that aren't the rate of its normal frequency underneath in hypertime, but are skip, are, it's skipping through uh, time and space. At a, at a greater rate. In other words, so as, as, it, as it moves towards relevant relativistic velocity, you can think of it as normally a, a space quanta, the amount of, the minimum amount of space that an object could move is uh, a particular constant. And as it approaches a relativistic velocity, that distance increases. And so it starts skipping through space at a greater rate to accommodate for its relativistic velocity. And so that is a very, very neat and tidy mechanism for you know, interpreting and dealing with the implications of special relativity. And so um, the details about what hypertime should be or could be quantified as, it's a very tough choice. A very tough decision because technically hypertime itself is a wavelength. It's a distance in space that something travels. It's that time quanta that is crossed with the space quanta that has been uh, abstracted out in the quantum mechanics to preserve our Newtonian notion of what time is. And so theories like string theory and M theory and um, the concept of a Hilbert space, uh, these all use these other variable assignments to flesh out this very uh, conundrum. But I think the problem is that the philosophy is foul. The philosophy isn't where it should be on the nature of the science. And when Evangelista Torricelli uh, discovered that uh, you could create a quote-unquote vacuum in a glass tube by filling it with mercury and then inverting it and letting gravity pull down on the mercury, there becomes this space that uh, was assumed to be completely vacuous. Now, with our knowledge of quantum mechanics, if we go back and analyze that situation, it's completely laughable that that experiment would be used to try to uh, unseat our philosophical um, ground for our third dimensional reality. In other words, to say that there is a space where there is nothing 
is to violate the conservation of that space. If, if there's a place where there's nothing, then all of our three-dimensional measurements are just ridiculous. And so this is, uh, you know, this is what I originally, uh, I originally broke with the school back in 1986, something like 85, 86. I broke with the, broke with the school over it because the, 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 the thing has not been properly treated. If, if in this day and age that same discovery would be made, if, if Torricelli um, tried to say this, uh, in this day and age, he'd be laughed at, at, you know, laughed out of his seat, um, because we know from what we've understood about the nature of uh, material, seemingly solid material, that there's all this unaccounted for area, this undefined space that exists between what we theorize as the, the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. And so this is a big problem. This is a huge problem for science. Glass isn't even a solid. Glass is act technically a liquid. And that this liquid keeps its form in some semi-permeable state. Obviously, if, you, if it's glass, you can shine a light through glass. Something's moving through the wall of that, of that object. And we know now that we can create similar photonic and electronic signals that will penetrate any known solid substance. We can send we can send a waveform, a particle waveform, through just about anything if it's accelerated fast enough. And so the concept of solidity um, is called into question. And so, in a sense, astrotometry is very much leaning towards the wave camp that 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 matter is a waveform, a standing waveform rather than a particle. And the, the particle notion uh, falls out of the, the density and the complexity of the waveform. When a waveform is sufficiently complex, if you think about the surf crashing on the, on the, uh, the, the, the beach, once that wave curls, it, it, takes on a different, it takes on a different characteristic. It makes waves itself at that point. At that point, it becomes a generator of waves from the same energy from which it was born. And this, more than anything, this concept, more than anything, is the basis of astrotometry.